You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. On Sunday, word starts to leak out as to who is making this 2023 opening day roster for the Chicago White Sox. And when Lurie Garcia, it comes out that he's not making the team, the explosion across White Sox social media was just something to sit back and behold. I didn't think they would eat $11 million and admit their mistake. But now when I look at it, Ed, I think it was inevitable since the beginning of spring training that they weren't going to continue because he's an attachment to mistakes during the La Russa two years that were nothing but a debacle and a waste of a section of your window of contention with this group that was put together. And he, he was the guy who carried on his shoulders the, the Rick Hahn mistakes, the Tony La Russa misuse of him. Like, I wasn't really angry with him, but he represented something to me that was bad about the organization. Yeah, well, that's just it. He is not, as a player, he's not a guy that you sit there and you go, Oh, I, I just absolutely cannot stand him. But what you do is you look at him and you go, why is this guy the longest tenured White Sox player? Why has this guy had 10 years not being a starter on this team and never never arriving as an everyday player, never meeting the initial, you know, the initial investment that you made in him when you acquired him from the Rangers all those years ago? Where you saw, thought, you know, hey, this guy's got some talent. We might, maybe we've got a center fielder on our hands. Maybe we've got an infielder on our hands. No, he proved over the years what he was. He's just a utility guy. And those guys are a dime a dozen. You pick them up off the street in spring training and you put them on your roster. What you never, ever do is guarantee them a lot of money when you are a team that turns around and says, we don't have a lot of money to spend. Five and a half million a year for three years. And that's what they did. And they did it quickly right before the lockout began, and it didn't make any sense. And there's all the theories of whether or not Tony La Russa was the guy behind the move, but the GM is the guy that signed him, and the guy behind the GM that pops up when things are good and disappears when things are bad, and Kenny Williams is a part of that as well. And I think what he represented, especially last year when things were falling apart, he was he was Tony La Russa's crutch, and he was being used in ways that made absolutely no sense. He became the lightning rod for the anger of White Sox fans. When when spring training begins and you hear Rick Hahn talking about Romy Gonzalez as the next Ben Zobrist or a Ben Zobrist type player. Diet Ben Zobrist. Right. And, and he can't stop raving about him. And meanwhile, Gonzalez went out and did nothing in spring to, to win a job on this team. And, and he's, he's cheaper and you could have optioned him back into AAA. But I believe that when you're talking to season ticket holders and they're angry at you and you're sending out those surveys about what do you think about individual players, I think Larry became somebody they were seeing so much negativity about that from a PR standpoint, it was it was time to cut the cord and say everything that happened in the last couple of years that ticked you off, White Sox fans, we're going to get rid of. You know, bringing hands or Alberto and let's say somebody else goes instead of Gonzalez, like an outfielder like Billy Hamilton or Jake Berger makes the team. Then I would have sat there and said, Alberto outplayed Garcia and he earned the job and they said it's not about the money. But the fact that Gonzalez also made it, I think Garcia was out because you need to cut off everything that was bad because you have a real PR problem. You have angry fans you keep saying we need to earn their trust back. You, the The message seems to be just watch what's on the field and believe in us. I think their ticket sales are down. I think when you look in the comments, whenever their social media puts out anything, there is vitriol and anger, and they are they are trying to cut that cord and put like a big wall between what happened up until now and this is fresh start. And you couldn't have a fresh start with Larry Garcia on the team. Yeah, but you also have to factor in a little bit of what Romy Gonzalez did. Now, you're talking about his overall spring training, which kind of sucked. However, last week of spring training, 375 with a 1.291 OPS. Last 15 days of spring training, he is hitting 308 with a 1.129 OPS. So he actually did start to outplay Larry Garcia. And to my earlier point about what you have in utility guys, 
Romy Gonzalez, the bar for Romy Gonzalez to make the team is be competent in multiple positions on the field, which he is. Again, you're right. He's not a gold glove center fielder. Nobody's asking him to be. Be competent in the outfield. Be competent around the infield. And hit a little bit. All right, done. Hanser Alberto, same thing, except for not an outfielder. Just be competent around the infield. Hit a little bit. That's what he did in spring training. Eric Gonzalez did it too. You're not hearing his name mentioned much, but that's because he was an ex-pirate. The Pirates didn't want him, so you just sort of assume that he comes pre-broken. So, yeah, Larry outplayed, but I think you're right about that too. He is one of the last vestiges of something that went horribly wrong between the White Sox and their fans, and he had to go. He just had to go. And of course, Hanser Alberto got hit by a pitch on the hand yesterday, so you never know. Larry may still be there. Probably not, though. One place that I know we're going to be opening day, Cork and Carey at the park, 33rd in Princeton, in the shadow of the ballpark, extensive bar with a rotation of craft beers, familiar favorites, spirits, and wines. Bring the kids over, bring the family. Pre-game before the game, opening day this coming Monday. Going to bring some socks in the basement swag. Going to record some stuff for the show. We're not going to be hard to find. I'll probably hang out outside by the big giant banner in front of the place that declares it the home of the podcast for fans by fans. Learn more at CorkandCarry.com. But uh, yeah, I, I've seen these prognostications the last couple of days. A lot of national people still picking the Guardians to win this division and saying like the White Sox may not even be a 500 team. I, like I saw a few that got out in the last couple of days where so-called experts are like, well, you know, if we put them over under 82 games, what do you think? And a lot of people picking the under. And I, I just don't get it because I'm telling you right now, new attitude, uh, you know, new new manager that I'm really getting behind. I'm really getting excited about what he does. And when I see them select this roster, I say they're giving him the guys that he wants and I've got to give this a chance, and I'm walking into the season with positivity. Well, so am I, because we were walking into last season, in spite of our questions about Tony La Russa, we were walking into last season with the White Sox being picked to win the division. We were walking into last season with the White Sox being picked to advance in the playoffs further and be a potential World, World Series contender. And everybody was on board with that nationally. No, I oh, wasn't. Yeah, hold on, Sox. hold on a second. I want to... I wanna, point out that I was worried about how the team was constructed and that they had not done enough this in the This isn't offseason. about you, Christopher. This is not <laughs> about you. But here's to your point about the national media, okay? They just do what Pakoda tells them to do. They just do what Fangraphs tells them to do, okay? You had a bunch of guys have a bad year last year, and we know why they had a bad year, because Pedro Grafol got the job by basically saying, you're an extremely talented bunch of idiots, because you wasted your talent on not showing up to ball games and just assuming it was going to be easy for you. And so you didn't try that. I mean, I'm paraphrasing of course, cause I wasn't in the room when he got the job, but that's what we heard, right? When he got the job, he walked in and said, the Kansas city Royals were clowning you because we were the less talented team and we went out and whooped you. And it was because you guys didn't bother to show up. So one year later, the talent level hasn't changed. The manager has changed. The attitude seemingly should have changed around the league also they've made some moves to improve themselves and yet because some mathematical model looks at last year's debacle and says well that must mean these guys aren't talented uh, everybody's sitting there going oh the white Sox suck because they don't know they don't actually pay attention to this team they only do what the mathematics tell them to do and they haven't been paying attention and i'm sorry you can't go from one year sitting there saying this is a world series roster to taking the exact same roster what Minus Liam Hendricks, probably for for all the season, if not most of it. I would assume so. And and adding a better right fielder and adding a better left fielder, and yes, subtracting Jose Abreu, I understand. But sitting there saying we're taking a more complete roster into this season, and last year they were World Series contender, but this year they're dog meat. No, that's not. I mean, that is that is where White Sox fans, quite frankly, get the sort of attitude that they're ascribed to to constantly have and and the sort of feeling like nobody cares because you you just sit there and you watch this stuff and it does make your blood boil to sit there and go how how are you look how are you looking at this rotation and looking at the guardians rotation which is right now shane bieber cal quantrill tristan mckenzie might be hurt aaron savali has to make a massive comeback from what he used to be because he he fell apart aaron savali looks terrible in spring training. and zach please looks terrible too and yeah. zach please looked terrible last year 
They don't have a starting rotation right now. The White Sox need to get out quick and they can. They can jump all over the Guardians to start this season. Okay, like I don't know what's going to happen that first weekend. I mean, look, it's the home opening series for the Houston Astros. Saying that they're going to go in and they're going to win that series to kick off the season may be a little bit of a long shot, but who knows? It's opening weekend. Let's see what they do. They're going to play four games there. If they got a split, I'd be like, yeah, great. Good way to start off the season. Now let's get home and get on our run because that's a tough start. But overall, in the first 30 days, first 30 to 45 days of this season, this team should jump out and get above everybody else in this division. That's what I expect from them. That's what they need to do. They got to get out, get hot, and get going right off the get, off the bat. If we're sitting here when it comes around to Memorial Day weekend and we're a 500 team, you're going to have a much less positive Chris because they need to get going and, and jump right out on these Guardians. And they have every opportunity to do so. You got a healthy team. You got guys that are clicking that don't normally click at this time. Yohan Mankata looking really good out there. there. There's so much momentum, I think, walking in. You got the positive attitude and you got the new manager. Let's go. And and they, they got to just jump right out and go. And I think they can. And, and I think you're going to have a lot of people saying, oh, what a surprise on the south side of Chicago. It's not going to be a surprise to me. Because I think this team is good. This team's going to win the division. I don't know what they're going to do in the postseason. That's a long way away. We'll see how they're constructed. We'll see how the team does at the trade deadline, what's available, what's needed. But right now, I think this is a team that should win the AL Central. And again, I feel more positive about this team right now going into the season than I felt about the team last year with Tony La Russa at the helm and the way that they constructed their roster. This is better constructed with a better attitude sitting over there in the manager's chair. And you want to talk about being able to get out early. I'm sorry, the Astros are not at 100% walking out of spring training. They're missing a couple of key members of their starting rotation, uh, Lance McCullers, and then when I say missing Justin Verlander, he's not there anymore, okay? Their opening day starter is Framber Valdez, who the Sox have shown that they can crush. Honestly, the Giants coming to town for the Sox home first home series, I had a bigger test in some ways than the Astros because the Astros, again, are a little beat up. The Pirates come after the uh, the Giants, and, oh, buddy, if you don't sweep them, I don't know. And then the <laughs> Twins. I'm not impressed by the Twins. I'm not impressed by the Orioles. And the Phillies are also really kind of beat to snot. Yeah, so, they've, they've got some problems going into the season. Get out quick yeah. and jump all over them. And then you end, you end the month of April with Tampa – the Blue Jays, and Tampa again, right? And that could be, that will be a litmus test right there because they can jump out quickly with those with those first bunch of series and then they get to, to April 21st in the Rays, they're at Tampa Bay. If they split coming out of three with Tampa, three with the Blue Jays, and four with the Rays, first of all, mathematically, they can't split that, so I'm going to take that statement and shove it right up. But if they come out of that, basically having gone... One over or even one under, I'm okay with that because I think on the whole, they're going to be able to jump out on them. And and I haven't looked at the Guardian schedule, but again, Shane Bieber, Tristan McKenzie's got forearm tightness, Cal Quantrill, and then two guys that have been absolutely terrible in spring and were terrible last year for him. Don't tell me that the Guardians are a juggernaut. I've had a lot of people ask me recently about high at home medical equipment. What exactly is it? What do they do? I feel like I explain it really well, but let's break it down. The idea is you want to keep mom and dad or grandma and grandpa out of assisted living. Make it so they can get around on their own and live independently. That means stair lifts, ramps, grab bars, lift chairs, even bathroom remodeling. And they work with your insurance. Plus, they have 0% financing for qualified individuals. It's all about switching to a new age of life. Anyone using a CPAP machine, unhappy with your vendor, switch. Get supplies directly mailed to you from Hyatt Home Medical Equipment. Plus, you can test out all the equipment at their showroom. They also have the latest in continuous glucose monitors. They are a medical equipment superstore ready to answer all of your questions. Learn more at hhme.com or stop in and see them 3518 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park. Let's talk about the outfield picture because I think with this bench, 
that has been created now, according to reports. It's not official yet, but they they basically had to make their decisions over the weekend because some guys like Hans or Alberto could have elected to become a free agent and gone someplace else. So they, they kind of had to inform these players of what they were doing before they actually have to make the official moves. And, and I believe when you look at the 40-man roster right now, Liam Hendricks will go to the 60-day. That'll open up one spot to, to uh, put Oscar Colas on there. Uh, Larry Garcia getting DFA'd uh, makes room for Hanser Alberto. And then you got that Rule 5 guy, Nick Avila, who likely gets returned unless they pull off some kind of trade. But let's say he gets returned, you're going to have one spot that's open. And then, and then you look at all these these non-roster invites, especially the outfielders like Hamilton and Marisnik. From what I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, they basically can get released but then re-signed into the minors, but they don't need to be on the 40-man. Explain this to me. Well, yeah, they're just non-roster invitees right now. So they get cut, effectively. They're free agents. And what happens is a lot of, a lot of these guys that are kind of fringe major leaguers what they do is they just go and see where's the next team that wants you know wants to have me, right? So they're not necessarily out there, uh, you know, can't come back to the White Sox, can't go sign and play in Charlotte. They can. It's just a question of, of what the White Sox want to do with them. So if they think, for example, Marisnik is a guy that they're going to count on to shuttle up and down during the year, uh, it, you know, and I don't know what Jake Marisnik's options are, and I Honestly, I'm not paying that much attention to Jake Marisnik's career. But if they think that somebody like him, they're going to call him up eventually. Well, then, yeah, they might they might maneuver it so that he's on the 40-man roster so they don't have to make a spot down the road. But they're essentially free. Once they become free agents, they're free to come back and sign. Luke Voigt just did it for the Brewers where he opted out and then immediately signed a new deal with the Brewers to come right back. I would think a guy like Billy Hamilton – is is going to stick around with the White Sox or anybody that really wants to have an opportunity during the year to come up and play center field because you really are a 15-day IL stint for Luis Robert. If that happens, you're up in the majors because the White Sox are are basically putting an outfield together in which Aloy Jimenez is the fourth outfielder and he's going to move into the corners whenever Robert needs a rest or if Benintendi needs a rest or if Oscar Colas needs a rest. Hey, he, he'll move into the corners when, when Robert needs one, and one of those corner guys will move in the center. And if the corner guys need a rest, he just moves into there. And, and, and you'll see a guy like Gavin Sheets get an awful lot of at-bats in the DH spot when those kind of decisions are being made. I think that's how that's all going to rotate around. I don't think you're going to see Sheets out in the outfield. I think that's what Pedro's talking about when he says uh, we're going to get about 50 games or so of Aloy out in the outfield because he's going to be in one of those corner positions. So what you don't have, though, is a guy who could every day stand out there for a couple of weeks if something happens to Robert. So you would think that somebody is going to be like, wait, I'm really the backup center fielder. I'm just playing in Charlotte. And when they need me for long term, I'm coming up to the majors. So there's got to be some allure to at least some of the guys that are sitting there right now in camp and possibly other center fielders that may get released and are floating around. But I would think that they'll have something backing that up in Charlotte for what I hope is not an inevitable Luis Robert I.L. stint. Wouldn't it be great if you could get through the whole year without one? You know, but I think as a Sox fan, That'd you're be like, pretty amazing. As a Sox fan, though, you're basically looking at like five or six of these guys going, well, at some point they're going on the I.L. And you got to think that the White Sox as a front office look at the team like that. Like at some point over 162, this is what we're going to have to do. And they're probably pitching that to guys when they're trying to figure out exactly how they're setting everything up, backing up guys in AAA down in Charlotte. But but it is interesting to me when you look at the outfield, what they decided to do, if everything that's been reported comes true with the way that their bench is set up, they're essentially saying, you know, you have Jimenez who can go into the corners and you also have Romy Gonzalez who can go out there as well if need be. But when I hear Pedro sit there and say, I want a set lineup and I want these guys playing most days, if you're a White Sox fan who's paid attention over the last couple of years, and even Renteria did it, there was way too much moving around. There was way too much, where's this guy playing today? Where is he in the batting order? I love this. I love the idea that it's going to be a pretty set lineup. Ozzie Guillen used a pretty set lineup back in 2005. He'd get crazy on Sundays. Those were crazy Ozzie days. But otherwise, he basically kept guys in the same spot for the entire year. And then he made a little bit of an adjustment going into the postseason when he decided to move Everett down two spaces and move Die up. But the entire year, he stuck with Everett in the three and Die down in the five. Like, he knew what everybody was capable of, and he barely made any changes except for on crazy Ozzie days on the sun on a Sunday. And 
And I think we're going to get a little bit of that. It's going to be a lot more like that with Pedro. And I think that's also going to help, too, with the injury factor, and here's why. If you know you're playing every day, you're going to take care of yourself. You are going to be a little bit more conscientious about seeing the trainer if something's wrong because you're not going to sit there and just go, ah, give me a day or two off and throw this guy out there, or I'm going to DH for a couple of days because Tony said I'm probably going to DH this week anyway. When guys are stuck in a routine and they know they're playing and they have to do their game day routine all the time, and they know their day off is Sunday, or they know their day off is upcoming, or they know that they actually have an injury and they're going to take some time off. When you have that set lineup, you know, listen to Steve Stone talk about it, listen to any former player talk about it, even listen to current players talk about it. They will talk about the fact that their game day routine, when they know they're playing, when they know they got to be out there, is far more regimented than the days when they are off. And if you're screwing around with that, I'm sorry, guys get lazy, right? If you and I know what time we have to be at work every day what time we're coming home what time the kids have to be a place just even as as you know normal guys we're far more focused and regimented on when we have to be somewhere and what we have to do and you don't get sloppy with it i think it's going to be great for that as well for their focus for their regimen for how they treat their bodies for how they take care of themselves and how they they treat the minor stuff so it doesn't become major stuff but also look at the way it's constructed do you really care if Hanser Alberto plays more than 40 games this year? Do you really care how many games Romy Gonzalez gets into? Is there anybody there short of Sebi Zavala who is going to probably, you know, has a chance to, to, to be behind the plate quite a bit if, if Yaz doesn't hold up. But is there anybody, Gavin Sheets, Jake Burgers, or anybody that's been talked about as a bench player that you're sitting there saying, this guy has shown us he's got to be in over Oscar Colas or Andrew Benintendi, or he's got to be in over Elvis Andrews or Tim Anderson or even Yohan Moncada. No, maybe the people who are like Jake Berger should play third and Yohan should go away. But even then, you know, I'm not sure that Jake has done anything to really show that he is a got to be there and got to be in every day. You're talking about snubs there. And that of course is clear tap room talk. That's getting down at the bar looking at the guy next to you who's also a Sox fan and starting a conversation about who got left off this roster. One of the best tap rooms, beer halls, working breweries on the South Side is the official brewery of Sox in the basement, Hailstorm Brewing. Two beers I recently tried there. One, I'm not sure if it's even on tap yet. I am not a pepper beer person. They made a hot pepper beer that wasn't too hot for me to say, I'll have a whole pint of that. But the Oaks... You gotta try the Oaks. 9% Imperial Brown Ale, it'll knock your socks off. Will Turner, the brewer over there, is always doing like really fun stuff, and that's what a brewery should be like. I like it when they have their standards, their favorites, their award winners, which they have, and then they have something new and exciting. Great lunch specials now. You gotta get in there, and there's a new brewery tour and beer tasting event up on their website right now, April the 27th. Check that out in everything that has to do with Hailstorm Brewing Company, 8060 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue, hailstormbrewing.com. And you're talking about snubs. And I know a lot of people are asking the question, did Jake Berger get snubbed from making this roster? Did so-and-so get snubbed from making this roster? I look at a snub as a guy that earned, statistically you can see it, went out there and did something better than what somebody else did. Like like in an all-star game, right? Somebody who just had better stats, but didn't make the team. Jake Berger isn't that. I mean, Jake Berger, 263 with a 791 OPS. It's fine. He had four home runs. That's good. I, You know, he struck out 18 times and only walked twice. That's concerning. And there was nothing that made me say, you got to put a guy in there that really can only play one position or, you know, he could be on the corner maybe, maybe he stands at first and also at third as a backup, and he hits right-handed, and you've got a guy that pretty much can stand over at first base if Andrew Vaughn needs a day off and Gavin Sheets already, who's a left-handed power hitter. Like, there was, to me, I understand why he isn't taken. If you want to pick a snub, look at Adam Hazley. Right? I was just thinking, Hazley is, Hazley got snubbed, I thought, a little bit last year, potentially. Yeah. And this year. That's a guy, I mean, think yeah. about that. Nice. He, he was a high draft pick, wasn't he? And then and then he got released, and then we picked him up, and he was somebody else's garbage. And, and you know, he's been up and down, and he never did anything that impressed me. But in, in spring training this year, the guy went out there, and it's, again, always small sample size. But over 37 at-bats in 20 games, he hits 405 
595 slugging with a 1016 OPS. And he's a guy who can play center field. And five stolen bases. Right. He's the first guy up, I think, if anything happens to Luis Robert. Like, expect that. Yeah. He'll be up. Yeah. That's that's the guy right there that you sit there and go, Adam Hazley, now that Adam Engel is gone. Right. Adam Hazley was penciled in, in my mind, to be the fourth outfielder if they kept a traditional fourth outfielder. And to be honest with you, as much as I love Gavin Sheets as a, as a left-handed power hitter, if you were to tell me that they're going to keep Hazley and they're going to put Sheets down at, at Charlotte to get every day at bats, maybe work on hitting against lefties and being able to take advantage of the shift rules by being able to hit it in the air to left field a little bit, I would not bat an eye at that because I would kind of like to have Hazley's ability to come off the bench, stand in center if need be, play the corner outfield spots, also run a base for somebody. And I know Billy Hamilton can do that too, but Hamilton only hit 069 for the year, so yeah. Billy bats he ain't. And Hazley had five steals in in you know really 21 games versus Hamilton's 19. So that feels like a guy that should be on the team if you're going to sit there and cry foul and cry snub about somebody. It's it's Adam Hazley who should be who should be the new man of steel. S T E A L. Well, here's the thing. Like let's look at those four bench spots that are reported, right? So Sebi Zavala, of course, the backup catcher, that, that's one. It's basically locked in. We knew that's who it was going to be. So then you look at the other three. Hanser Alberto won the job. He was he was the best guy for, in terms of a utility infielder that could move around. And with Elvis being really the backup shortstop, where if Anderson needs to sit down, he just moves a short and Alberto goes a second, it all, it all makes perfect sense, right? Okay, then you look at the next two spots, which is Sheets and Gonzalez. Sheets was a guy that we heard several beat reporters come on and tell us. Merkin and Fegan both came on and told us this is a guy that they just basically had already written in as making this team. They had plans for him. They know how they want to use him. He's a left-handed bat. He brings power, and they have every intention of bringing him along. You could make the argument that if he and Jake Berger hit from the same side of the plate, Jake Berger was the better option. Oh, absolutely. Because I don't think you're you're not putting Sheets in the outfield very often, even with this configuration. I don't think he's out in the corner outfield very much at all. You know, so really Berger can play third at least and back that up, or he can just go over and stand at first and he could be a DH. It's pretty much the same guy, and Berger outplayed him, but Sheets was clearly already in their minds, at least to those that that cover the team, that he was already on his way to Chicago and, and a member. So then all that left is the last spot. And that's where the Romy Gonzalez thing is a little curious. Like, I'm not mad about it, right? I'm not mad about it. But he never, like you said, he did turn it on at the back end of spring training. And it is somebody that they've had their eye on. But you could have very easily started him down in AAA and brought Hazley, who's red hot right now. But then you'd also have to decide, like, hey, if the kid's not really going to play that often, maybe we're wasting him at the major league level. I guarantee he was a conversation. Like, on that final list of guys where they were trying to figure it out, I think the three that were already on the list going into the last day when they made their final decision would have been Sheets, would have been Alberto, would would have been Zavala. And then they had sitting there like, well, do we want Lurie? Nope. All right. They moved on from that. And then they said, well, we can bring Gonzalez because of what he brings with the versatility and moving around. And he's been hot the last week or so. We can bring Hazley as the backup. But in reality, he's only there to back up Luis Robert. And as long as Robert's healthy, we could just stash him in triple A. And uh, Eric Gonzalez looked pretty good. Maybe he could hang out here. Maybe we can figure out a way to keep him down the minors, but we're not going to bring him. So that they picked Romy. And Berger was probably mentioned for about half a second there, and they sat there and said he would do better to continue to work on his defense down in the minor leagues because and, and, and if he continues to perform down there and he's blocked, maybe somebody comes along at some point and says, we want Jake Berger to be our third baseman. I think we've been talking about that for a year now. About, like, eventually you would think that he probably has a better chance on somebody else's team than on the White Sox. I think he's coming up. I think you're going to see him this year, but he's just not a guy who starts on this team or makes the 26 man when everybody's healthy. No, at some point, somewhere in the middle of the season, when the Sox are are in need of that one thing, maybe it's a closer because they the closer by committee hasn't worked. Maybe it's a fifth starter because there's been an injury. You know, maybe it's it's uh you know someone to replace someone who's gotten hurt and Berger can't fill that. But at some point, I think this might be the year if Jake goes down and hits well at AAA and is is playing really well. 
that somebody says, you know what? I'm going to call the White Sox because I'm going to go out and get me a burger. That music indicates the Sox nerd is on the line. Dave Marin probably is looking forward to opening day coming up here. And he's got all kinds of tidbits and trivia and knowledge to drop on you when you're out at Guaranteed Rate Field because he puts it up on the scoreboard for your enjoyment. He also brings it right here to Sox in the Basement as we nerd out with the Sox nerd. And it is all brought to you by the law offices of Parente and Norum. When you've been injured, you need a team that will do what it takes to fight for your rights. The insurance companies only care about one thing, their bottom line. Law Offices of Parente and Norum has the experience, dedication, proven results it takes to get you the care and compensation you deserve. They brought in almost a half billion dollars for their injured clients and loved ones. Socks in the Basement listeners get a free case evaluation. Just call or text them 312-641-5926 or visit pninjurylaw.com. Socks nerd, outfield, we're at the end of spring training. We've gone around the horn. We tried every position. What can you tell me about the outfield? Chris, we've got to cover the Sox outfield like Lance Johnson and Mike Cameron, so here goes. Let's start in the middle. Luis Robert in center field. Good old number 88 is on track to make his fourth straight opening day start in center field for the Sox. That hasn't happened since Lance Johnson's run of six straight in the early 1990s. Also, Robert will become the first center fielder originally signed by the Sox to make four straight opening day starts for the team. Now, 2022 marked the third straight year Robert had the Sox hardest hit ball per stat cast, which speaks to the raw potential this guy has. Hopefully, this is the year we get to see 150 games of a player I think has a skill set unlike no other player in Sox history. Moving to left, there's Andrew Benintendi, the pickup. I'm not saying history is on the Sox side here, but the last time they started the season with an outfield acquisition wearing number 23, they won the World Series. That's Jermaine Dye in 2005 for all you newbies. Two things I liked about Ben Benintendi when I did my deep dive on him. He hits well against the AL Central, at least 285 against every club in the division, and he kills the Cubs. Ben Benintendi has hit for a higher average against the Cubs at 478 than against any other team, and six of his 11 hits against Chicago's other team have gone for extra bases. In right, like most Sox fans, I can't wait to see Oscar Colas. There's a chance Colas will become the first player since Harold Baines in 1980 to make his big league debut on opening day in right field for the Sox. And then there's Eloy Jimenez. While I'm sure there was a sentiment for Eloy to settle in as the DH for obvious reasons, he hits better, way better when he plays left field. He slashes 290, 333, and 526 as a left fielder and 235, 311, and 433 as a DH. Eloy did hit a career-high 274 with 11 homers as a DH last year, so maybe he's warming to the role. So who has hit well as a DH? Vaughn was good last year, hitting 310 in 29 games. Gavin Sheets, a candidate to play the outfield as well, was good in 2021, but down in 2022. And Jake Berger has done fine with four homers in 40 career at-bats while hitting 250 in 13 games as a DH. And really, wouldn't it be nice to see old Jake thrive in that spot after all he's been through? Now, Chris, you asked for some Larry Zingers because Larry's name has been in the news lately, so I thought I'd offer a few nuggets on him. Larry made a Sox debut on August 23rd, 2013 against Texas. The Rangers shortstop that day was Elvis Andrews. Ooh. And their catcher was A.J. Pierzynski in his first game at Guaranteed Rate Field since leaving the Sox. That's amazing. How about that? Chris, only one person shorter than the five foot eight Garcia has hit more homers for the Sox, and that was five foot seven Mike Krivich with thirty six to Larry's thirty four. Uh, Larry has played more Sox games, six hundred and seventy six, than the likes of Uribe, Kittle, Valentin, Shoeless Joe Jackson, Tim Raines, and Jim Tomey. Uh, Larry's seventieth all time, and he's one game at catcher and first base away from joining Frank Isbell and Steve Lyons as the only players to appear at every position in their Sox careers. And let's not forget, Larry is just one of eight Sox players to hit at least a three-run homer in the postseason. 
He joins Wise, Paulie, who had two, Tadahito Aguchi, AJ, Scott Pesednik, Ted Klazuski, and Sherm Lawler in that club. So there you have it, the Larry Five. Now that uh, Larry Garcia is gone, which player do you think that I will gravitate to uh, to be annoyed with being on the 26-man roster, and I will be annoyed with them Kendall mainly. Graveman. You don't even have to finish the question. You're already annoyed with Kendall Graveman. I think it's going to be Kendall Graveman. Man, you know me so well. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found, and always on SocksInTheBasement.com.